Right, let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Quick Bites. Um, this is when we try and provide snap analysis of some of the big developments in food policy in the UK. And um, I'm really delighted that today we have Jack Ward speaking with speaking with me. Um, Jack is the chief exec of British Growers. Um, uh, and we, he has just come literally fresh from number 10 from uh, the Prime Minister's Food Security Summit. So we're going to hear hot off the press exactly um, what happened this morning uh, and uh, start to have a little think about what the implications of it are, where the good news is, where, where it falls short and what might what might happen next. So a very warm welcome, Jack. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. Um, so, um, as, as with always, um, everyone, just so you know, this will be recorded, so um, there is a chance to share it with other people after the event, um, if you have colleagues who, who might want to listen as well. Um, and uh, we, of course, always welcome feedback, so please do uh, give us any feedback after the event as to the things that you enjoyed or what we can do more or less of. That's always very, very welcome. So, Jack, let's get straight into the details. Perhaps let's start with who was there and who wasn't there. As you know, there was a, quite a bit of concern in the last few days that some key people, even people like Henry Dimbleby, were not invited. But obviously some important people were invited um, and we'd like to hear who, who was there. And do you think there are any important gaps in the in the invitation list? Right, well, um, there was a lot of interest in K Caleb and uh, Charlie Island from Clarkson's Farm. <laughs> you know, they were there in, in, uh, in all their glory. Um, and from there, uh, there was a fairly eclectic bunch of people. Um, I wouldn't profess to know them all, but it did range from, um, you know, real life farmers in the group I chaired. There were a couple from Yorkshire, um, you know, one from the hills in Yorkshire, one from the sort of lower lands in Yorkshire. Um, and then right through to retailer bosses. So there were people there from food processing industry. Um, Minette Batters was there. Uh, you know, there was, um, you know, a broad spread of people. It was, you know, pretty representative of the entire food chain. And so did, in addition to the supermarkets, were there... Uh, hospitality and sort of contract catering, that yes. bit of... Yeah, yeah. Bit of so well. I launched that with the boss of Sodexo, so, you know, he was there. So, um, yeah, yeah. as I say, it was a pretty broad collection of people. I wouldn't profess to know them all, but... Um, and, you know, and a smattering of scientists, people from academia as well. OK, great. And um, what about um, how many, roughly? I mean, roughly? Like, is I it think there were thick end of... Uh, heading towards 100, I would think, perhaps okay. 80, something like that. There were sort of about 20 in each group. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, some of those were officials, um, ministers. You know, what was interesting was actually we met um, at Downing Street. Um, we were asked to be there for 9.30, and they very kindly laid on um, um, some refreshments. But uh, it was actually at the same time as the cabinet meeting. There was a cabinet meeting going on at the same time. So after the cabinet meeting, several of the cabinet came out and um, introduced themselves. So, you know, it was very much a who's who in the current government. So, um, right. <laughs> okay. Was, I'm presuming you've been in number 10 before, so it wasn't a complete novelty. No, it was a complete novelty. I oh, was it? Fantastic. The black door. No, it was a complete novelty. It, it, is interest, it is interesting because it's kind of... It is like a bit like a rabbit warren. I mean, it is, it, it is impressive. But, um, you know, it's probably not quite like walking into the White House or the um, <laughs> Versailles or something like that. Um, you know, you do get the feel this is very much a working venue. Right. OK. And did you get the obligatory pick at the door? I'm embarrassed to Selfie. say we did do that. It's yeah, good, we good, did good. Do that. We did do that. <laughs> because they took, your, they took all your phones away. As soon as you walked in, there was a whole bunch of pigeons holes. And they were, oh, yeah. yeah. Down there. Everything else goes down there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. So you were there to presumably try and represent the growers. Maybe just tell everybody just in a nutshell what British Growers is so they can guess, get a bit of a sense of where you fit into yeah, the picture. Sure. Yeah, so British Growers operates in the fresh produce sector. Um, and our main function actually is to look after other organisations. So we provide an administration and accountancy service to about 40 different organisations which operate within the fresh produce industry. And that includes... Um, grower associations, things like brassica growers, onion growers, carrot growers, leek growers, salad growers. 
Um, we look after a number of grower groups in producer organizations. I think we've got about seven of those. Um, we look after the Chartered Hort Institute of Horticulture. Um, we look after some promotion bodies, British apples and pears and British berries. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's our main function. And because we have so much contact with the um, horticultural sector, uh, we do build up some quite useful insights into what's happening within that sector. And there aren't necessarily always that many people who understand the sector that well in terms of you know, how it operates from, let's say, mushrooms up at the extreme, one extreme end, through to vining peas at the other end. And you know, it is quite helpful for the industry to have uh, an organisation that does understand how the whole thing knits together. Mm. And presumably a key part of your role when you say you look after them is to sort of feed their experiences and concerns into the policy process I mean that's part of a big part of your job right yes and that, and that bit of it has um, grown significantly really as a result of Brexit because you know up till Brexit um, you know they tended to paddle their own canoes um, but post Brexit there was a whole big issue around labour um, we got another big issue around producer organisations. And then we started running into, um, you know, particular weather issues. And British Growers was quite a convenient vehicle through which growers could reflect their views and thoughts back to the wider public and in particular the retailers um, mm. around shortages or problems that they were having. Um, so it made the operating environment and the negotiating environment in which they work uh, a little bit easier. And actually, we've tended to develop that role. Um, you know, and as we know, um, you know, we've been beset by weather problems. You know, weather problems have been compounded by you know a whole series of other issues, um, the pandemic and then the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so actually the demand for representation has grown quite significantly in the past sort of five, seven years. Mm, yeah, OK. So that's a very helpful sort of reminder of the context of today's conversation. Mm. Obviously, we've still got food inflation at astronomical levels. 19.1% will get the new data, I believe, on yeah. the 24th of May. Um, the Prime Minister set a target for halving inflation in January, which would mean we'd need to get inflation, uh, food inflation to 8% by the end of the year. That's going to be a, that's a quite a, um, an ambitious trajectory. Um, we should, um, when you look at the global food prices, I was reminding myself of where that graph had got to, and it actually started to fall a year ago now, but obviously there's this kind of huge hmm. lag through the system getting to the point where it actually affects, you know, baskets. Um, do you think, I mean, and, and obviously there's a sort of backdrop there of um, increasingly kind of no noisy uh, concerns in the media about a supermarket's maintaining prices artificially high and not being responsive enough to inflation coming down. I don't know. Um, it's obviously very difficult to have data on that. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, that's something that I think that's prompted today's discussion. But but also, I think um, a concern about what's happening on farms. So there's the mm -hmm. sort of in, there's the consumer problem, which yep. is we're seeing it healthy food becoming more and more and more unaffordable for households because of low incomes. And then at the other end, farmers who are just going out of business and not mm. or, or not able to run their operations mm. because mm. of the sort of scale of the barriers that they're facing so maybe tell us a little bit about what you think about that sort of challenge okay. yep. and particularly the farmer perspective as you see it well let's see if we can unpick it a bit um i think the good news for consumers in inflation is the price of wheat around the world has come back down it's not so good for growers but it's good for consumers so <laughs> off the back of that um, there should be some scope for um, price reductions in certain products, you know, bread and one or two staples. Now, let's deal with vegetables, because that's the area I know and I understand. So if we rather than take the inflation increase for the year, let's look at the inflation increase over five years, because actually what has happened um, in the last sort of 10 years is fresh produce prices have tended to come down. So the classic example I can give you is carrots. So 2014, carrots were 80 pence a kilo. 2017, they were 60 pence a kilo. 
Today, they are still, they are around 50 something pence a kilo. So whilst there has been an increase in the price this year, they're still cheaper than they were five years ago. And what has happened in the vegetable sector, and this is a sector that's of particular interest to us, is that effectively over five, we've had five years of sort of general inflation, you know, 2%, 3%, whatever it was, and then a year of superinflation when it went to 20%. And over the five years of 2% inflation, growers were expected to continually reduce the costs that they sold to the retailers for. So they were looking constantly for productivity gains, ways of cutting out cost, and they were pretty successful in doing that. And consumers in, let's say, 2019 got a fantastic deal. But ultimately, everybody ran out of road. There was nowhere left to go. If your input prices you know, are going through the roof, and you're operating you know, on a 1% margin, you've absolutely got nowhere left to go. And so the increase in fresh produce prices, which you know, they're nothing like the, the increases they've quoted for pasta and cheese um, and one or two other bits and pieces, um, you know, are really an attempt to get back to something like the prices that were being paid in you know, 2017. Now, the other thing that's worth mentioning on um, price increases is that um, we've had two back to back weather events. So we had the drought of 2022, um, which uh, meant that in volume terms, we were short on volume. So we were mm -hmm. short on volume on real staple crops like brassicas, that's cabbages, cauliflowers. Um, Brussels sprouts, those kind of things. We were short on carrots. We were short on leeks and we were short on onions. And what we really needed um, this season was an early season, a dry season and a warm season. What we've been delivered is a late season, a wet season and a cold season. So what's happened is we've started to run short of produce from probably February onwards. And we then had to reach out into Europe and say, has anybody got any spare produce going? And somebody puts their hand up and say, yeah, we've got some cauliflowers. And instead of paying a pound ago for cauliflowers, we were importing them at three pounds ago. So that shortage, that lack of supply has forced the um, food, the, the supply chain to go out across the world and have to bid for whatever they can get from wherever they can get it. Mm, OK. There's a kind so, of add on. Go on. So do you think that so one of the obviously one of the sort of hoped for um, policy commitments that we, mm. a number of us, yourself, yeah. Food Foundation and others have been pushing for in, um, has been the follow through of the commitment by the government to develop a horticulture strategy, yeah. which we hoped would be, a, you know, a serious look at where are the areas mm. where we can grow more of our produce in Britain? How do we make sure those supply chains are fairer? Can we look at alternative routes to market for, for smaller producers? are there good ways of driving up consumption alongside production and that whole kind of package of things. Mm. Then we heard strangely that the horticulture strategy had been dropped. Um, what's your sense from the conversation today about where the state of that conversation is now? And did you get any assurances from the prime minister that they're looking seriously at these challenges? Yeah, I did. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's involved in a government strategy. And whilst you know we did a lot of work through the Fruit and Veg Alliance um, in terms of putting forward suggestions, <clears throat> what I'm not clear about is the extent to which a government then has to consult with a whole series of other government departments before they can call it, quote, a government strategy. Because if it's a government strategy, presumably it's representative of everybody that might have an interest in it. And goodness knows what that, what's involved in trying to get that agreed. So what we've got today, I think, is some fairly key elements of what we were asking for um, signed up by the prime minister. I mean, you know, in some ways, OK, we haven't got a strategy, but we have a commitment from the prime minister to grow the fresh produce sector of um, UK production. Uh, you know, and actually, that is probably as good as we could have hoped for. You and, know, we any, could have, go on. And, and any any. So that's a good that's that's a good first step, obviously. Yep. Um, 
how, how any indication as to the sort of strategies which are going to be used for doing that? Well, the Prime Minister's speech was, I think, less than five minutes, but let me just run through what he said. So <clears throat> they're really keen to promote the fruit and veg industry. And I suspect a lot of this is now um, awaiting the industry to backfill the detail because, you know, DEFRA has a certain amount of expertise in this, but they need support from the industry in terms of how to do it. Um, specifically, supply chain fairness. That was, you know, pretty much on um, uh, his... Uh, uh, list of announcements, um, the retention of an independent grocery code adjudicator. So that is not going to be rolled into the Competitions and Markets Authority, which is really good news because you know enables him to continue to focus on you know, the bits that we're interested in. Um, an extension, not an extension, but he announced that for 2024, the number of seasonal labour uh, permits is going to be 45,000 with the 10,000 contingency. Um, and that's something we've been asking for for some time, because normally we get summoned just before Christmas um, and told in two or three days before Christmas that it's available. So that's good. You know, it makes people it makes um, uh, planning a little bit easier. Uh, you know, he announced some support for glasshouse production and also um, the rolling out of a new producer organization scheme. So. You know, when you actually look at the list and compare it with what we put into our strategy, we may not have got everything, but against that, we've got a commitment from the person at the top to say, we want to make this happen. And actually, on balance, I think we've done pretty well. And what was there? So I'm interested in whether Trey's Coffee said anything and what you picked up from that. And also, what was the nature of it, given you had the retailer heads around the table and there was a strong focus on fairness? You know, what was the nature of that conversation? Is there a recognition by the retailers that there's a problem here that needs to be fixed? Um, I didn't sit in the retailer session, so I can't comment on that. I I think the retailers are in a difficult position too. I don't think I don't think it's straightforward. Um, mm. you know, they are being pulled every which way. Um, you know, we're telling them, you know, you've got to charge more for your food because there isn't enough money in the supply chain to reward. Um, the growers and reward yourself. So, you know, ultimately, um, by the time you know consumers see the price on the shelf, that is not a fair reflection of what it's cost to put there. And, you know, that is not a great position for anybody to be in running a business. Um, <laughs> sorry, what was the other thing we were talking about? I wondered if, if Therese Coffee Therese had made Coffee. any comments, because well, obviously she'd upset the NFU uh at the at the, the uh, nfu conference and i think that was sort of uh, certainly what i was picking up that was one of the reasons why this event happened was to try and rebuild some of those bridges it was an interesting moment because um she chaired the final session and uh uh there was a comment on the end because she did finish it on time at two o'clock uh, one o'clock or whatever it finished and she did say see i can run it on time which i think <laughs> is uh, <laughs> an interesting reference i said you know <laughs> Give her a due. She'd obviously had to fight um, to get the prime minister to do this. Um, you know, goodness knows what's going through the prime minister's mind. You know, today he had a cabinet meeting. He hasn't gone off to Ireland to a, uh, sorry Iceland to a G7 summit. You know, this afternoon he'd fly to Iceland. Um, then he's got to go to Japan um, and circumvent going around Russia apparently. Um, and actually, to have persuaded the prime minister to give up Downing Street. And quite a lot of Downing Street resource because um, you know, I was talking to you know some of the, um, the staff and they said actually you know Downing Street has been all over this. Um, we've really had to work hard to um, uh, you know make it work for the Downing Street staff. So you know she's obviously done quite a lot behind the scenes to get that prime ministerial commitment, and it's quite easy in this. No, it's quite easy to sort of dismiss that. Um, you know, and I know we're becoming increasingly cynical about politics. Um, but in this instance, you know, we have to travel, hopefully. Um, you know, and to be honest, this is a major step in the right direction in trying to get the recognition that um, our food industry needs. OK, well, that that's that's good to hear. Um, I think certainly when we've been looking at the stuff that's come out of it and also who was there really a little concerned that the well two concerns one is that 
where's the voice of consumers really in the room? Obviously you had the supermarkets, but it felt like a really quite significant gap that there wasn't um, a broader citizen sort of representation there, particularly in the, because it's when you look at the package of stuff, you just think, well, how is this really going to help people here and now who are struggling with the cost of living? There was really nothing on, on that sort of problem. And then I think the other concern that, that I had looking at it was that this could be, um, you know, important short-term commitments dealing with a politi quite political challenge and a challenge in the media. But is it really grasping this, this, this system problem that we've got, which the National Food Strategy highlighted, but doesn't feel like we're anywhere close to really grasping some of those you know, really thinking about the long term resilience of the supply chains, how we what that right mix is of land use, UK production, how we link that to eating the right things. That bigger narrative is still it feels very off the table, but perhaps you got a different sense of it. Um, no, I think, I, you know, I think that criticism is you know perfectly valid. I tell you what I think they want to do. <laughs> is they want to actually deliver some stuff. I think they want to be able in 18 months to go back and say, we delivered X, Y, Z. I think, um, you know, some of the issues you've referred to, um, you know, I just wonder how they would actually make a difference um, with the resources that they've got at their disposal. Um, you know, coupled with the fact we have to remember that there's going to be an election within two years. So they're on a pretty short time scale and, you know, this is probably about trying to have some impact in the next two years. You yeah. know, it's, it's the reality of politics, whether we like yeah. it or not. Um, you know, this is the reality of politics and we have to kind of grab the wins where we can get them. And from your, so what was the most interesting moment from your perspective? Like the one, the most interesting intervention, the most interesting thing somebody said or hopeful thing, something that you really will remember. I think, You know, probably actually what the prime minister, you know, the prime minister bounced in through one of the side doors, you know, leapt up onto the um, um, podium and his kind of usual um, uh, energetic self. And, you know, I thought spoke really well, um, you know, about our industry. Um, yeah, I, you know, that I think was quite a seminal moment in it. The fact that the prime minister was there to pledge his support for what we're doing, I think, you know, I don't think we should overlook that, you know, in the, it, particularly in the current political climate of everything else he's got to do. You know, the fact that he turned up and he said, personally, I want to see this happen, um, you know, I think was pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. Good. OK, um, let's just move on very briefly to the, the commitment around Labour. Mm -hmm. So the commitment was, you noted, um, uh around 45,000 um yeah. workers um and i'm just i'm interested to just this is not an area that the food foundations looked into in a lot of detail but i did read about some of the concerns last year um around uh the labor that was migrant mm. labor yeah. workers that were coming yeah. to the uk and concerns that they were the the agents that were handling their recruitment yeah. um did not adopt the right practices and that people were in some instances paying for that recruitment process mm -hmm. or the travel mm -hmm. and some of those conditions which really point towards forced labor rather than you know yeah. the right labor standards um it, it, you know i'd like I, it would be good to hear your thoughts on that and whether you think some of those issues are now resolved and can be prevented this year. Yeah. So we just need to go back a little bit. So um, in the first iteration of the current seasonal worker permit scheme, which would have been 2020, where are we? Three, 2021, I think, or 20. <clears throat> we relied very heavily on recruits that came from Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. So I would think virtually 70% of them were recruited from Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. And as we got into um, the autumn of 2021 um, and the recruitment 
for 2022 got underway, they went back to the Ukraine, Belarus and Russia to re-recruit those who'd come back before, um, plus the additional because um, we'd upped the numbers to 45,000. And then obviously February, very sadly, we saw the Russian invasion of Ukraine and suddenly 70% of the workforce that had been recruited was no longer available. So the operators had to start from scratch and go out and find a replacement 45,000 or whatever the number was um, from other parts of the world. And I think what happened was that there was an over-reliance placed on some of the recruitment organizations that were employed in other parts of the world. Um, now, how has that been addressed? Um, that has been addressed by the Home Office, um, who have um, been looking at the, um, the permit conditions. Um, and uh, I think nobody wants to see this, least of all the operators, least of all the growers, um, mm. because it's not a happy situation. Uh, and there has been something in the press. I, you know, the, there's been sort of a bit of staring in the press about this. Um, but, uh, you know, the Home Office is very keen to make sure, as are the operators, um, you know, and I think you'd have this commitment from the operators if they were here on this um, call, uh, that they want to see a robust scheme. They want to make sure everybody's rewarded fairly because, um, you know, these people are the lifeblood of the fresh produce sector. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, I really, I really hope you're right. I mean, I was mm. reading a, a statement which investors has actually written at the time, uh, raising some of these concerns around the seasonal mm. worker scheme. So I think, first of all, very good that investors have sort of spotted this and and highlighting it in, in a public manner. But And let's hope, as you say, that by doing so, it's helped mm. to avert it happening this year. Um, good. Well, we're almost, we are pretty much out of time, Jack. Um, I'm so grateful that you have just come literally from number 10 to do this and to speak to everyone. We've got, or, you know, we have this time, like about, this is in about five hours, 128 people have signed up to come along wow. and listen. So wow. I think there's a lot of interest in just, you know, mm. hearing the news fresh, um, as it comes from number 10. Um, I'm really, really hopeful that this, that at least this level of political commitment around horticulture in particular, mm. will start to translate into mm. thinking about some of those really big challenges around production and consumption of fruit and veg. Mm. Um, and as you say, that these commitments today just start a, a new path yeah. of the conversation around this. Um, because uh, it seems to me that, you know, if we get fruit and veg right, a lot of other things follow yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. from a kind of diet and, and, mm. and environment perspective. So yeah. I think there's, there's lots of opportunities there. Um, mm. So thank you for, for your time today. Um, you're pleasure. probably a bit pleasure. in desperate need of a rest now. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> like not quite an intense morning. Um, but look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everybody, Great. for joining. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. And uh, be in touch again soon. Oh, yeah. just a quick advert. Our next Quick Bites, everybody, is going to be with um, Dr. Francesca Branca, who is the Director of Nutrition at the World Health Organization, about the new report they've come at, uh, published on sweeteners. Um, we'll circulate the um, timing of that on social media as normal and in our newsletter. So do look out for that. It's going to be a really interesting conversation, I think. Thanks ever so much, Jack, and have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Anna. Bye.